Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. My name is Alexander Booth, and I'm a senior analyst with the Texas Rangers Baseball Club. And I'm Ryan Stoll, a data engineer with the Texas Rangers. We're very excited to be talking to you today about the big data revolution in the age of Moneyball. We're gonna start off by discussing our agenda and a little bit of background in who we are, and then we'll go into our presentation. So we will be discussing the age of Moneyball and how it has revolutionized the game of baseball. We're talking about a technology called StatCast, which allows us to track everything from ball movements to players to even the hip trajectory of a pitcher and everything about the swing and weather that happens inside of a major league game. Then we'll talk about how the Rangers utilize Databricks to analyze this sheer vast amount of big data coming into all of our data pipelines. Finally, we'll end with a case study talking about the new science of hitting, which will go into how we can use machine learning and big data to predict how a ball will fall for a hit and how we can use that to optimize our players to hit more strategically. Uh, as mentioned before, my name is Alexander Booth. I have been with the Rangers since 2018. So this is my fifth season with the club. I'm a senior analyst within their research and development department. Before the Rangers, I worked as a machine learning engineer and front end developer for a company in Chicago called McMaster Car. And without any further ado, I will hand this over to my colleague Ryan to introduce himself and start off our presentation. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Alexander. I'm Ryan Stoll, a data engineer with the Texas Rangers. I've been with the Rangers for about a year and a half. And before that, I was a business intelligence analyst at Canon USA in Long Island, New York. And it was also an IT consultant with Ernst & Young in New York City before that. The Age of Moneyball. In case you're not familiar, Moneyball is a book written by Michael Lewis that was also made into a movie in 2011 that starred Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill as Oakland A's executives who use data-informed decisions to keep the A's competitive in an unbalanced Major League Baseball landscape. Although there have been years of research and thousands of words written about using statistics to make smarter baseball decisions by people like Bill James, this is often pointed to as the first example of a Major League organization really buying into this approach. One of the main ideas described in the book and movie is the idea of placing more emphasis on player on base percentage than his batting average. In case you're unaware, these are two key statistics in baseball. Up until this time, batting average had been one of the leading metrics the teams used to evaluate player performance and base decisions off of. Even today, players are described by their batting averages, as in this player is a 300 hitter, which is meant to convey the idea that he provides his team with above average offensive performance. However, a big discovery described in the book was that on-base percentage has a higher correlation with total run scored than batting average. After all, scoring runs is the main goal of the offense in baseball and ultimately how teams win games. So this is a pretty important thing to have a correlation with. The main difference between on-base percentage and batting average is that batting average ex excludes walks, which is when a batter takes four pitches out of the strike zone without swinging. In this case, the batter is awarded first base and any runner in front of him is awarded the next base. It's hard to say why walks went undervalued by teams for so long and why it was excluded from the batting average formula to begin with, but it might be because walks are more often painted as a failure of the pitcher than a success of the batter. However, we now know that plate discipline and taking walks is a repeatable and measurable skill of hitters that greatly contributes to a team's success. As they say, Billy had identified a market inefficiency which allowed the Oakland A's to acquire players undervalued by the market using information like looking at on-base percentage instead of batting average. This could help them win more games at a lower price point. The idea to use data and statistics to make better decisions in sports left a legacy far beyond baseball, eventually seeping into every other major sport from football and basketball to tennis, golf, and many other popular sports today. StatCast Revolution. For those unaware, StatCast is the name given to the current state of baseball tracking technology operated by Major League Baseball. This allows for the collection and analysis of massive amounts of baseball data. As you'll see, StatCast has been powered by different technologies over the years, but the name refers to the latest iteration of advanced baseball tracking. 
Five years after the A's began using their Moneyball approach, MLB introduced PitchFX in 2006, which was a three camera tracking system that was created and maintained by a company called Sport Vision. PitchFX could automatically track speed and trajectories of pitch balls, which allowed for a consistent visual representation of pitches as well as categorization of pitches. This was a huge leap forward for baseball tracking technology and it opened the door for future more advanced systems to be developed. In 2015, StatCast, which is a combination of camera and radar systems, was installed in all 30 major league ballparks for the first time. It provided radar and HD video measures for all action on the field on a per pitch basis. This was further enhanced by technology developed by TrackMan, a company previously focused on golf that uses Doppler radar to pick up ball flight metrics for the pitcher and hitter. Some of the metrics this system produces has entered the baseball fans lexicon, like spin rate, horizontal and vertical movement, and hit exit speed and launch angle. Finally, MLB made the switch in 2020 to using Hawkeye to power StatCast, which could do everything the previous system could and more. You may have heard of Hawkeye as the camera system that powers instant replays in tennis. However, in baseball, Hawkeye consists of 12 high-speed cameras installed around the ballpark, which are dedicated to either pitch tracking or tracking players and batted balls. This system raised the percentage of batted balls that get tracked from 89 to 99%, in part because of this multi-camera approach. Beyond pitching and hitting, it can also track running and fielding in the form of sprint speed, base-to-base -base times, arm strength, catch probability, and much more. More recently, MLB has made skeletal, skeletal data available to its member clubs. This comes in the form of X, Y, and Z coordinates for 18 points on a player's body, like the shoulder, elbow, wrist, knee, and this is on a 30 frame per second basis. As you can imagine, this easily produces millions of data points for each game that our analysts need to be able to make sense of, and traditional programs running on local machines are no longer sufficient for this problem. One such use of this data, this skeletal data, is for fan engagement and entertainment. MLB Field Vision takes the limb tracking data and transforms it into a 3D experience that enables fans to watch plays unfold from never before seen camera angles. Major League teams, on the other hand, might use the skeletal data to develop their own metrics, like fielding and base running metrics, that get to a much deeper and nuanced level of what each player is doing on a particular play. Another field of exploration enabled by Hawkeye is observed spin and seam tracking. Before Hawkeye, capturing actual pitch spin and direction was impossible. Analysts could only go off of a calculated or inferred spin, which was determined with models using pitch trajectory and speed, among other factors, and the idea that an object's rotation has an effect on its path. However, some pitches weren't following the path that one would expect using the available factors alone. This led to the concept of seam shifted wake, which is the idea that the seam orientation of a pitch has a measurable and significant impact on its flight path. This effect is caused by the asymmetry in the rough versus smooth side of the ball, basically where the seams are. Hawkeye allowed this to be directly measured for the first time, as well as spin rate and direction, and has really opened the door for advanced pitching analysis and design. This created new positions in baseball and even whole companies within the sport of baseball. One final example I'll tell you about of big data that MLB makes available to all 30 clubs is LiDAR scans and weather tracking. The LiDAR scans provide us with high resolution 3D representations of the 30 major league ballparks. This is done by taking, measuring the time that it takes for reflected light emitted from an airborne object to return to its source. It's not just to measure outfield wall distance either, but the shape of the ballpark in general, which can have an effect on flight path as you can imagine. This detailed mapping coupled with weather data refreshed every five minutes and the right tools allows us to answer the question, how do the specific ballpark and weather characteristics affect the game? So that's data that MLB makes available to all 30 clubs, but this is a slide we put together to list some of the technologies that clubs can use to gain additional insights on their players. Some of these are in the realm of high-speed motion capture, both markered and markerless, bat sensors that can tell you things like swing speed and swing path, 
and things like force plates, which measure where a batter or hitter are placing their weight. All of these things continue to contribute to the big data landscape that all 30 teams are undoubtedly having to grapple with. And to give you an idea of what this technology actually looks like, this is an example of a state-of-the-art pitching lab at Wake Forest University. And this implies those high-speed cameras, motion capture technology, force plates that we talked about. This allows for the analysis of pitcher mechanics and the development of custom training programs aimed at reducing injury risk and enhancing player performance. So this explosion in baseball data is not only taking place at the major league level, but also the minor leagues and even amateur teams like colleges and universities. So now we'll shift gears to discussing how the Texas Rangers handle big data and utilize Databricks to execute and centralize our analyses. Like any other enterprise, baseball front offices have internal departments dedicated to different areas that keep the organization moving forward. These departments have typically had their own data, their own reports, their own way of doing things that would be more transparent in an ideal world. After all, everyone wants to consume data from the players to the coaches to the highest levels of the front office. You see our manager, Chris Woodward, there wearing an analytics t-shirt. This problem of consolidating our information is further made difficult by all the technologies we utilize that may or may not have integrations with one another. It's also hard, if not impossible, to predict the future in terms of where we'll be five years from now and what the best choice of software will be in the long run. And this is where Databricks and the Unified Analytics Platform comes in. For my job in particular as the lead data engineer, I'm responsible for setting up the pipelines that ingest data from different types of sources. These data pipelines have to be as agile and resistant to failure as possible. Like a lot of you, we get data from APIs, FTPs, databases, both external and internal, cloud buckets. And these data can come in the form of CSV, JSON, Parquet, video, all of which we have to handle in the most efficient manner possible. Before Databricks, we had different ingestion scripts written in different languages running on different on-prem and cloud-based servers, all saving to different databases. But with Databricks Notebook saving to Delta Lake, we're able to centralize our ingestion scripts that extract data from all the different sources. It can flatten, transform, and clean our data and save to stage tables before ultimately landing in our enterprise data warehouse. By using Spark, Koalas, and the new integration of Koalas into PySpark, we can perform distributed extraction requests. This has become necessary for us to transform millions of pitches with as much compute as required, and we can do this at the speed of Spark. The amount of data we receive is only increased with each passing year and will only continue to increase. So we need to be able to leverage the Databricks platform and all of its latest features to keep up. I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Alexander, to talk about how we use Databricks in the analytics space. Thank you so much, Ryan, for your amazing background on the StatCast revolution, the technology that we are currently importing, as well as our data engineering challenges. On the analytics side, we really wanted to focus on a concept that is near and dear to my efficient and automated heart, and that is machine learning operations. Um, with machine learning operations, we are able to track our machine learning models as they iterate and change from development to production. Further, by having our machine learning operations occur in the same unified analytics platform as our data engineering, we can connect our models with our data in exactly the same place that it's being processed. This allows us to score and generate predictions as soon as our data is extracted and transformed. By doing this, we are able to communicate our insights super quickly to our stakeholders, including our players and coaches. Before, it would take up to 24 hours after a game finished before our predictions and metrics could be relayed to players. Now we're able to provide those predictions in a matter of hours. So I mentioned machine learning operations at the top of this discussion. What exactly is machine learning operations? Well, MLOps takes its name from a combination of DevOps as well as data engineering and machine learning. DevOps is characterized by a couple of key principles, shared ownership, workflow automation, as well as rapid feedback. Automation is a core principle in the DevOps pipeline, and it'll translate as well to what we do with machine learning operations. 
We need to have continuous integration, continuous deployments, and automated promotion of models, as well as being able to track when our models fail to be able to communicate and iterate to maintain our competitive advantage. MLOps involves building, deploying, and maintaining these machine learning models reliably and continuously in an automated way. Further, the machine learning operations will allow us to have code reviews and peer reviews of all of our models to make sure that everyone is able to understand what the purpose and the outputs of each model actually is. Some benefits of machine learning operations are gonna be the same types of benefits that you would see from any DevOps platform. Since everyone has access to all of the models stored in the registry, that increases transparency. We have easy peer and code reviews of our outputs. We can recommend new features or new transformations that we found efficient in the past. Further, these models can be retrained on a schedule every month, every week, every night, and the new trained model can be promoted to production all automatically on scheduled jobs. We can also monitor our models. We can monitor for shift in our targets. We can, mo we can monitor for changes in our metrics. This will allow us to go back and iterate on our models more effectively before the uh, drift in our metrics occurs too far down the pipeline and is in front of our stakeholders. Um, all model changes are tracked. And this is a very important to us. We use GitHub a lot in terms of our coding expertise. However, tracking changes to models in GitHub is not, a fa is not the most optimal way. As you'll see, Databricks provides a platform called MLflow that will allow us to do all of this and more. MLflow integrates with every machine learning environment that you can think of, everything from TensorFlow, PyTorch, Spark, Scikit-Learn, even to AutoML platforms like H2O. Um, you can have more exotic models like XGBoost, LightGBM, uh, Conda, FastAI. It's honestly amazing all the different integrations that are tracked inside of that model. Um, there are dozens of companies that utilize MLflow. We're obviously not the first to use ML operations, but we are seeing the impact on our organization already. My one last note here is that we're able to track models built in different languages. As we have analysts use Python and R and other model languages themselves, being able to have all of these models in one location allows for further benefits of sustainability. So machine learning operations is really comprised of two key features, model tracking and the model registry. Model tracking is important. This allows us to log features, parameters, different model algorithms and metrics for any single machine learning problem. Further, all of these models can be reproduced. So in a typical machine learning development cycle, we are trying dozens of different algorithms across dozens of different feature stores with many different hyperparameters as well. Comparing all of these models to figure out the most optimized and efficient combination of hyperparameters, algorithms, and features can be draining. Doing that in Excel, you lose track of all your different columns. Writing it down in a notebook, who writes down anything anymore? So being able to automate and track all of these experiments using MLflow provides huge benefit in terms of model comparison. It also allows us to track our train of thought. We can see how a particular model evolved over time. The second key component to machine learning operations is the model registry. The model registry is essentially a centralized cloud storage location for machine learning models built in both Python and R, as well as integrating with auto machine learning frameworks. All previously stored versions of a model are saved and can be promoted through development, staging, and production environments. So once we've used model tracking and experiments to select a final model, we can put it in the model registry, and then we can QA it in our staging environment before deploying to production. Further, as we iterate on our model and we create a second version that we want to promote, we can deprecate the original and promote the second model automatically using, and we can still see how they have changed. This is essential for us because we want to compare how our predictions have changed as our models have changed. So being able to reference these old deprecated versions allows us to do that. 
The other benefit to the registry is hosting our models in a REST API endpoint. Anyone in our network can post a data set to this endpoint and receive predictions back. As I won't get too far ahead of myself here, this will really help us, especially when we start integrating streaming services. In summary, by using MLflow within the Databricks Unified Analytics Platform, the Texas Rangers R&D Department have created a centralized machine learning repository to host all of our models. By centralizing our models in this repository, our team has identified duplicated models that we have been able to eliminate, as well as provide a single constant source of truth. One model for whatever we're trying to measure. We have one model for pitch evaluation, one model for strike probability or hit effectiveness. And these models can be used by anyone across all of our departments. We're no longer siloed by someone in one department building a model that is also being built by a second person in a second silo. We have one centralized location with transparency and automated access. These models can be integrated into our unified data pipeline. And this is also, as I mentioned at the beginning, really important to us. As Ryan discussed with our data engineering pipelines, being able to square predictions using models in the same location gives us again, one location and one place to put everything together. And this unification really does help tear down our silos as well as help make our communication faster and our time to insights more efficient. So what's kind of one use case that we can do with this amazing data engineering pipeline and machine learning operation workflow? Well, streaming. Streaming is another impact of big data. We are receiving data super quickly with a high velocity during games. Uh, this screenshot is actually coming from the MLB app on your phone. If you go follow a game on ESPN, MLB, you will see these numbers pop up. You'll see the player statistics. You'll see the trajectory of the ball. You'll also see the outcome of the play. However, this is not the only data that we receive during games. When you go to a game and look at the scoreboard, you're going to see something that looks like this. Again, we still have our career stats for our players, but in that bottom toolbar at the bottom of the screen, you'll see exit velocity, exit angle, and distance. This is tracking the speed of which of the ball off the bat. It's tracking the angle that the ball went off the bat. And it's tracking how far the ball went into the stadium. This is ball tracking. This is essentially the stat cast data that Ryan discussed coming to us in real time and appearing on our scoreboard. We also see that the pitch that was thrown was 81 miles an hour. Again, more ball tracking that is coming our way. All of these numbers, exit velocity, movement, sprint speed, we are receiving this information as it happens during a game. So how can we use this information from bullpens, batting practices, and even high school games to understand and make decisions as quickly as possible? We can use a technology called Autoloader, which again is part of the Databricks Unified Analytics Platform. Autoloader is an optimized cloud file source for Spark that loads data continuously and efficiently from cloud storage as new data continues to arrive. Essentially, as long as the data is being loaded into cloud storage, we can run an autoloader listener job to take that data and bring it into Databricks and Delta Lake. Further, because our models are also hosted on Databricks, we can score that stream data into a silver table before finally pushing it into some gold table that can be sent down and reports built off of. So before, by having multiple jobs to load in multiple different data sources in at once, for example, from our APIs, from our FTPs, uh, we can just have one location, our cloud storage bucket, and one listener job with Autoloader to read all of our data in using Spark. This set and forget model really eliminates the complicated setup of using multiple ingestion scripts and multiple ingestion listeners. As mentioned, we're able to stream in data using APIs in the form of JSON, but other streaming data comes from FTPs in the form of CSVs. With Autoloader, we can put together a script to load them into cloud storage, where they can then be scored using our machine learning models and pulled automatically into our data lake. 
As soon as the data is received, we can predict on it, generate our metrics, and send that information as quickly as possible to the players and coaches who are using it to make decisions in game. So what kind of decisions can be made off of data like this? Well, here you will see a strike zone, but not just any strike zone. This is a strike zone for an umpire. If you've ever watched a game of baseball, you will have groaned and cheered as the umpire makes good or bad calls for your team as well as the opposing team. We've all seen that pitch really inside, almost hugging our batter's ribs be called a strike or that pitch right down the middle or that hit the edge that the umpire called a ball. Um, umpires have tendencies. Some umpires are more likely than others to call different pitches, strikes, or balls against different right-handed or left-handed batters. Using data streamed during a game, we can approximate an umpire's tendencies while the game is occurring. This can really help us, especially in the lighter last half of a game, understand exactly where we need to be throwing or locating our pitches to get a most likely strike given an umpire's opinions or tendencies for that specific night. So as an example here, imagine one umpire who is calling pitches in the lower left-hand corner of the zone balls. We can identify that within the first couple of innings and shift our strategy to make sure that our pitcher is throwing more inside the actual zone instead of that outside corner. In converse, if we know that the umpire is calling an inside strike more often than not, then we can also let our pitchers know that within the first couple of innings. And that way we can, again, shift our strategy. We can try and use this tendency to our advantage to try and gain a competitive advantage during a game. This is only one example of how predicted model outputs using ML flow and autoloader can change the game. We can also use stream data to affect and approximate fatigue in our pitchers, as well as look at exactly how our batter swing is producing. And going back to our batter swing, that's really going to go into our case study that we have here next. Case study, the new science of hitting. So far, we've really talked about baseball technology. We've discussed how the Texas Rangers are ingesting that baseball technology using Databricks in both a data engineering and machine learning driven way. But the point of all of this data is to make our players better. So how can we use this sheer vast amounts of data that we've already discussed and come up with a strategy to make our players the best version of themselves? Let's quickly talk about home runs. In 2017, home run rates started to skyrocket across the league. And while I'm not going to be talking about changes to the ball or juiced or dead end balls in this conversation, I'll let you do your own research there. We are going to talk about barrels. Hitters were quoted as trying to optimize specific launch angle and exit velocity combinations to achieve a barrel. So what exactly is a barrel and how can we tell this story using data? So our goal here for this project, we wanted to load in millions of pitches that have been thrown at the major league level since 2019. In fact, we managed to load in about 2 million pitches, again, at the speed of Spark. And our goal here is to look at these pitches, look at only the hits that were made, and see if some kind of sweet spot or combination of launch angle and exit velocity can be taken into account to predict the likelihood of a hit. So we are, from these 2 million pitches, we're able to filter down to 300,000 hits or balls in play. And we can use this data to predict a hit probability. So the features that we use to predict the probability of a hit were the launch angle. The launch angle is the up-down angle that a ball leaves the bat. We also looked at exit speed, which is the velocity of a ball off of the bat. Hit spray angle is the left to right angle that the ball left the bat. So was it closer to third base or first base? We also had a couple of categorical variables, infield positioning and outfield positioning. Uh, one of the new revolutions in baseball has been the idea of a defensive shift. By putting more players on one side of the infield, we can increase our likelihood of getting it out, especially if the hitter tends or has that tendency to hit the ball more often than not in that direction. 
So both the infield and the outfield shift to position their players optimally. How does that affect the probability of a hit? We will be investigating that here as well. Finally, we bring in the batter handedness and pitcher handedness, as these features can affect the probability of a hit. Different lefties and righties can implement different batted balls. Uh, you may have heard of that of pulling. So a left-handed hitter, if they pull the ball, it'll go more towards right field. I'm trying to imagine my ballpark now. But left-handed pit hitters hit the ball this way. Right-handed hitters hit the ball this way more often than not. So what model did we create? We created an XG boost model. So we split our data into a 75-25 train test split, and we created a XG boost classification model on this data. And it actually performs pretty well. We have an 84% accuracy, and our F1 scores on both hits and not hits are fairly high as well. Our rock curve looks sustainable, and we're pretty happy with this model. However, the true revolution will happen when we examine our feature importances. Looking at our feature importances, we see a couple of things that should probably be intuition by now. Launch angle and launch speed were the most impactful features in our model. This makes sense because as we mentioned before, hitters are trying to find that optimal combination of launch angle and launch speed. However, something that stood out to us was the fact that the infield shift as well as left-handed batters are also pretty important in determining whether or not a bad ball in play is hit for uh, a hit. So in case you don't know, left-handed hitters are more likely to have a shift on against them because left-handed hitters are more likely to hit the ball between first base and second base. Right-handed hitters are more likely to hit the ball across the entire ballpark, but lefties are always going to be pulling the ball more often than not. So many, many balls in play by left-handed hitters have died because of the shift. This is actually causing Major League Baseball to explore rule changes. To try and increase offense back into the game, they will ban the shift, which could happen as soon as next year. This will benefit left-handed hitters greatly, as they'll no longer have to worry about their ground balls being snagged by a shifted shortstop. By looking at the launch angle and exit velocity, we can plot our hit probability against those top two features. And the resulting graph is actually something beautiful. Uh, this is one of the most famous graphs in a modern offensive baseball strategy. And I'm sharing it with you today. As you'll notice, we have a bunch of red dots and blue dots. Blue dots are balls that are, have a very low hit probability. They are likely going to be out. Red dots are more likely to be hits. And we see there's about two different patterns here. We have a huge red blob to the far right of our graph. And we also have a red swoosh in the middle. Let's start with our red blob at the end. As you may have guessed, all of those are home runs. Being able to hit the ball over 100 miles an hour off the bat at an angle between 20 and 35 degrees you will almost always hit a home run. Of course, that's dependent on the ballpark that you're hitting in, but ballpark agnostic, those balls are almost always leaving the field. So while that accounts for our far right blob, what about our swoosh that we have in the middle of this graph? As you may notice, any ball hit between 60 miles an hour and 100 miles an hour at a specific launch angle of again, 20 to about 35 degrees, seem to always land for a hit. This is because at the weaker launch speeds, the weaker exit velocity, these balls will land over the heads of the infielders, but in front of the outfielders. And as our exit velocity goes up, these hard hitting balls suddenly go over the heads of our outfielders and bang off the wall and our guy hits a double. So here we can look at the optimal combinations to hit singles. That's gonna be between 60 and 80 miles an hour at 20 to 35 degrees or doubles and triples. That'll be between 80 and 100 miles an hour off the bat, again, at around 20 to 25 degrees launch. This has helped revolutionize a term called the sweet spot. This is what the launch angle revolution is. Batters have realized that if they hit the ball between 20 and 35 degrees, and they hit it hard enough, as in over 60 miles an hour, 
then that ball is going to drop for a hit. It may be a single, it may be a double, but either way, they are getting on base. And this takes us back all the way to the beginning of our presentation, to the great Billy Bean. You get on base, we win. You don't, we lose. And I hate losing. Modern baseball strategy has evolved from the on-base percentage market inefficiency of the money ball era. In this new age of big data, we are still trying to optimize the money ball strategy, getting on base. However, we can do so now with a more involved and intensive and specific strategy. Hit the ball at this angle, at this speed, and it will likely drop for a hit. If it drops for a hit, then you are on base, and that is going to help your team win. Not only has this impacted our hitters, but it has also impacted our pitchers as well. How can we pitch the ball to our player, to a hitter, so that they will not hit the ball at this specific angle, at this specific speed? How can we throw the ball in such a way that the hitter will not achieve that barrel or hit that sweet spot? This is only the beginning of the revolution in baseball. We, as Ryan discussed earlier, there's so much more going on in the era of pitch design, as well as sprint speed, defensive alignment, as well as optimizing our player development to be able to consume this data effectively. We want our players coming up from the minor leagues to be able to hit this sweet spot, throw the best pitches possible, and know exactly how to run to get a rogue fly ball. The big data revolution in baseball has only just started. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, I'll hand it back over to my colleague, Ryan Stoll, for his final words. Thanks, Alexander, great job. I hope that you learned a little bit more about how baseball teams are using advanced metrics to their advantage and how we're using Databricks to make sure that we can stay at the top of the competitive landscape. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of the conference. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone. Thank you so much for joining.